Hey, Cedric. 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 On that title, could you put 1820 Highway 80 West? Yeah, uh, now we're good. We're ready to roll. I'm excited. Got it. Ah, there they go. All right. Just start. I'm Brother Paul Williams, minister of the Metro East Church of Christ, bringing families together in love. Thank you for joining us. I'm Brother Paul Williams, minister of the Metro East Church of Christ, bringing families together in love. and want to welcome you to our program. Now, if you want to view our program, you can simply go to our online uh, website. Uh, this is also available at MetroEastCOC.org. Now, we're going to be pointing you to that website because it's a wealth of resources that are available for you there. We want to also encourage you to follow us uh, on Facebook as well as Twitter. Now, on Facebook, uh, you can follow us at uh, Metro East 
Church of Christ. We actually have a spot there. Also, you can uh, click on uh, Uplifting You with Brother Paul Williams. That's one of our groups that's on Facebook available for you. And follow us on Twitter at Metro East COC, uh, as well as Uplifting YOU. Oh, by the way, and while I have your attention on uh, following us, we also have a YouTube channel, which is under the same title, Metro East COC or Metro East Church of Christ channel. And we can also view us uh, on Ustream, uh, which is at Metro East COC as well. Every Sunday, uh, we have our services that are broadcast live for you over the internet at our website. Simply go to uh, the uh, Metro East uh, Church of Christ website, metroecoc.org, and simply go to the live broadcast television. When you click on that and you click on the, the uh, play button, you will you can actually see our services live, which is every Sunday, starting at about 1030 on Sunday morning and five o'clock on Sunday evenings. We also have daily classes available at 10 o'clock in the morning uh, for us on that same channel on the uh, on the website. And we're right now getting into a series. We're going to be talking about uh, marriage and, and premarital counseling and talking about these things. Now, first and foremost, we need to understand something, that God uh, is the creator of marriage. Now, the reason why we need to bring that up is because since God is the creator of marriage, then God will be the ideal resource to find out what we should do in a marriage. You got to remember that when, when, when God says uh, in Malachi, which we don't have this particular scripture, but this is an extra one for you. In Malachi chapter 2, verse 16, the Bible says, For I hate divorce, says the Lord God of Israel, and him who covers his garments with wrong, says the Lord of hosts. So take heed to your spirit that you do not deal treacherously. Dealing treacherously is when you divorce somebody for any inane reason whatsoever. And, and the children of Israel had a long standing history of just divorcing people for, for anything. So what we see in divorce today uh, is nothing new. In fact, it's old hat, uh, according to God. There were cases in the, in the Old Testament where men would divorce their wives just because they didn't like the way they looked that day and would leave her out on the street and all just all kinds of cruelty. Or they would trade in an old wife for a new wife. Or, and, and these were things that were unacceptable to God because God is the creator and the sustainer of marriage. And God purposely created marriage so that we would live a fruitful life with Without a lot of problems, without a lot of complications, um, and you even start looking at some of the statistics uh, from the from the pundits and the researchers, and and then you begin to find out that men live longer when they've been married, and women live longer and healthier lives, and and there's a stabilizing factor for both male and female in the marriage. Now, before we go any further. I'm quite aware in our country uh, that there is new legislation that talks about marriages uh, between partners uh, or homosexual marriages or unions and, and, uh, and, and partners and, and trying to establish rights. Um, I'm all for the rights and to receive medical treatment and medical benefits. And, and if you have and if you have someone that you love dearly, that you would want all of your benefits to go to at your death. I think that you have all the rights in the world to that. I, I have no problems with that. Now, from a spiritual standpoint, marriage was ordained by God and God ordained marriage between male and female. Now, I've researched the Bible thoroughly before we started this class, uh, and I find that there are, there are no approved examples of homosexual unions in the Bible. Uh, and you, know, I mean, you could go to the old uh, fire and brimstone, uh, man should not lie with man or with animal, and these are detestable to the Lord, and all those things are true in the Bible. Uh, and I understand uh, the sensitivity of it in today's world. However, marriage was still created by God. And we see the first marriage initiated by God between Adam and Eve. And the Bible specifically refers to Eve as Adam's wife, not live-in partner. Uh, and for clarification's sake, at Metro East Church of Christ, uh, we don't thump on one particular group of people and say, these are the bad ones and everybody else is okay. Let me just go ahead and make this real plain from the get go. Those who are in uh, same sex unions are in the same situation as those who are male, female, and they're living together and they're not married. Both are the exact same pornelio. This is where we get the word porno from. 
which means cohabitation. And in fact, in Romans chapter 13, we have the specific word in the King James Version of the Bible called chambering. Now, when you look up the word chambering, that means people who live together who are not married. And this is a sin in God's eyes right in the same vein as homosexuality. So what we teach at, at, at the Lord's Church is that, um, you know, don't point your fingers at those who are homosexual just because you can see that easier than those of you who are shacking. You're in the exact same boat that's going down the exact wrong way because God honors marriage between husband, male, and wife, female. Now, some questions to ask. There's some questions that we want to go over, and these questions are available on our website at MetroECOC.org. Some questions that you have to ask yourself before you get married. First of all, you, sh you, you want to set a date, obviously, but you don't want to be in such a hurry that you don't go through marital counseling. Now, we offer marital counseling at Metro East Church of Christ, but it's a 12-step program. And if 12, steps, uh, if 12 steps or 12 counseling sessions is too much for you to endure before you get married, maybe you're not ready for marriage. Uh, because marriage is for a lifetime. A few questions before we get to some of the scriptures that we're talking about is number one, why do you want to get married? That's one of the first questions you need to ask. Why do you really want to get married? Is it because you're financially strapped? That's a terrible reason to get married. Is it because your clock is ticking? You think it's just time to get married? What a, what a horrendous reason to get married. Then the, another question is, what was your family of origin like? How do you want your family to be like them? How do you want them to be differently? What will make it hard for you to leave your family of origin? How often will you visit them? How often do you want them to visit you? What would you call over-involvement of your in-laws? What would you call under-involvement of your in-laws? What sort of things would you talk over with them? Now, these are some questions, actually, that you need to answer with each other before you even start discussing a date. And these same questions are available on our website at MetroECOC.org under counseling uh, at the website. Another question, what traditions do you wish to establish in your new home? Do you plan to have family devotions, prayer before meals? Another question, what are your goals in life? How important is God and religion to you? How will religion affect your life and your marriage? How involved do you plan to be in your religious group? Are the two of you even in the same religious group? Uh, what were your dating experiences like? Uh, because sometimes you have two people that come together. One has a tremendous amount of uh, dating experience. Those who have ears, let them hear. Some have hardly any or none. Will that difference in appetite or experience cause a problem with false expectations? If you have someone who's grown up, uh, quite frankly, looking and, and, and idolizing porn, are they expecting their husband or wife to, to perform like a porn star, uh, which is crazy? Um, unless both of you are porn stars. Um, uh, so we're looking at false expectations sexually. Uh, you, you, what about the sexual appetite between the two of you? Uh, do you understand marriage? What do you understand marriage to be like? How much time do you plan to spend together? How close do you get? How much do you share with one another? How can you be an individual and married at the same time? One of the phenomenons that lead to divorce uh, is the idea that in a lot of cases, the women will lose themselves within the marriage because they begin to sacrifice so much of themselves in order to be married. And even on the male side, uh, that there becomes a growing resentment of marriage and of the relationship that can cause or lead to divorce. And remember what God said in Malachi chapter 2, verse 16. God says, I hate divorce. And the only reason why God says you should divorce someone is if they are maritally or sexually unfaithful to the marriage, refuses to repent, or it's something that you just can't handle and, 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 and you have been faithful to the marriage. Now, if you've cheated and they've cheated, then biblically speaking, neither one of you have the right to divorce each other because both of you violated the same contract. So the worst thing you could ever do is someone cheats on you and then you go get revenge and cheat back. Well, now you're, now you're stuck with each other, be quite frank about that because two wrongs don't make a right. Uh, number eight. Have you had a frightening experience, child sexual abuse, incest, or rape? This is a question that you have to answer because if you're not being honest with each other on what's happened to you in your past, these things can play out as you become more intimate because marriage is a very intimate relationship that allows for you to connect with someone, mind, body, and soul in a manner that you won't connect with anybody else in your lifetime. And if you have these horrible experiences that you are now a survivor of. Amen? 
then being a survivor makes you a strong partner to be with because you understand survival of the worst of the worst and you'd watch out for that so that your children are not affected by it. Uh, but it may make you ultra sensitive about who's around your children or it may make you ultra sensitive on how you're touched a certain way. It may trigger a memory uh, that may cause some friction or problems or outbursts of, of, of anger or crying. And so these are some questions. These are hard questions that we need to answer before we even set the date on possibly getting married. Another premarital question, do you have homosexual tendencies or experiences? Now that's for male and female. Um, experimenting in college, that counts as well uh, on both sides. Uh, there's a, there's a, uh, a dangerous phenomenon uh, that's going on which is called being on the down low with men um, where they, they, they use marriage to cover up uh, their homosexual closet lifestyle, which is just so dangerous. In Jackson alone recently, Jackson was cited as being number three in the nation uh, for AIDS cases uh, that's running rampant, particularly, uh, particularly more AIDS cases being reported among females, African-American females. So it's not a gay disease, it is a sexually transmitted disease. Uh, uh, and, and, and so AIDS is something that's spreading, it's, it's already spilled over into several segments of the population. Uh, not only is it sexually transmitted, but it's actually transmitted through, uh, through, through, through needle use. It can be by tra blood transfusion. Uh, so, so, so it's important for us to realize what those experiences, but now from a more emotional side, if you have homosexual tendencies or, or if you're battling it, you can't help who you're attracted to. And I understand that you can't help who you're attracted to. Nobody can. But do you have the spiritual strength to not allow that attraction to interfere with your marriage? Just like a, 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 homo, a heterosexual man may be attracted to other women, but he has to or she has to uh, have enough self-discipline to not allow themselves to go outside of their marriage to explore that attraction or to entertain it or meditate on it in their heads. If, you, if you're battling on it to the point where you're, you're about to fall off the cliff at any given moment, maybe you're not ready for marriage. If you're getting married to escape these feelings, you're not going to escape them. They will still be there when you're married. We're going to be getting to the Bible verses in a second. Just hang on. There's a couple more premarital questions we need to ask as we go through this program because maybe you've never been through a premarital counseling session um, and you're considering getting married. And it's better for you to look at these questions now uh, prior to marriage than after you are married. And even if you are married, it's good to look at them anyway because they make for a solid foundational discussion between a young couple who's putting their family together. Also, uh, how do you communicate? Do you talk about your feelings? How does your mate communicate when angry, when disappointed? Another question, what are the roles and responsibilities? How many hours per week do each of you plan to work? How are decisions going to be made? Uh, do you sometimes give in to each other? Or both of you work outside of the home? What will be done with the money? Who does what at home? Believe it or not, chores have caused folks uh, to, to, to get upset uh, and getting divorced. No kidding, no kidding, chores alone. Um, have you worked out a budget? What items do you consider necessary or desirable or extra? Can you afford to get married? Oh, that's a big one. In the beginning, when God created Adam, God gave Adam a few things before he was given a wife. Check this out. In the beginning, God created all the animals in the garden, the Garden of Eden, and then he created Adam. Adam had a place to stay. That's the first thing he had. Secondly, Adam had a job. His job was to take care of the Garden of Eden. Also, Adam had some education because remember, Adam had to name all of the animals in the garden. He had some education. If a man, sisters, doesn't have a place to stay, doesn't have a job, doesn't have an education of some kind, uh, I'm not talking about he has to have a PhD degree, but he has to have some kind of education where he's able to make a wage and, and able to understand God's word at the very least. Then you're not looking at a candidate that's going to be a good leader for you. Because understand, sisters, when you marry someone, you are marrying a man that you're entrusting leadership to. And if you don't respect his abilities as a leader, uh, then you're going to get frustrated with his lack of leadership. And it may begin to develop or engender regret or, in, or, or began to create resentment from you about him. And you don't want that to be the case either. Also, a uh, couple more questions. Do you ever rub each other the wrong way? 
If you do win, how? How do you handle it? 19, why do you think your marriage will work? How do you complement each other? In other words, how do you work together? Do you really work together or, or are you only friction? Or even worse, is the only time you get to get along, you fight and then you have premarital sex, which is another sin, and then you guys make up and you're okay. Let me tell you something. One of the best ways to find out if you really, really love each other, stop having sex. Now, I'm not assuming that you are having sex. I'm not, I'm not trying to uh, portray you as sinful and all this other kind of stuff. I'm just trying to talk. I'm just trying to talk in a real world sense because at Metro East, we believe in teaching real world things to real world people. And the Bible is a real world book all the way down, true and true. But you know, a lot of couples, when they say they are monogamous, they, they assign themselves a, a, a bit of righteousness with the idea of monogamy because I'm only with one partner. Now, but you gotta also understand, one partner is still sin in God's eyesight. But when you decide to stop having sex and still have a relationship, you begin to find out what someone's really going to be like when you're married to them. Because when the, when the novelty of sex is taken out of the equation, then how do you talk to each other? Then how do you resolve problems? Then how do you act when you see your, uh, your fiance interacting with other people of the same sex or of the opposite sex? How do you react when you see them with someone whom you feel is prettier or more handsome than yourself? Then you, do you begin to have freak out moments? Do your insecurities come out then? These are some things that we need to uh, examine. Now there are more questions that, that we can talk about, but they're available on our website at metroecoc.org. Now we go to the Bible as we look at these questions because we're talking about the foundation of marriage. And first understand that God is the creator and sustainer and architect of marriage and the home. God designed this in this manner. We're gonna be examining Genesis chapter one, uh, verse 26 through 28. And let's read what it says. In Genesis, it says, then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness and let them rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over the cattle of the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. God created man in his own image in the image of God, he created him. Male and female created them. God blessed them and said, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over everything that moves on the earth. First of all, we have to understand that God said, let us make man in our own image. God is triune, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. We are triune in our creation, mind, body, soul, or spirit and soul. God was relational from the very beginning. God was not alone because God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, all three are there at the very beginning of creation. God is one. Now we're not talking about Greek mythology where you have different gods like Zeus and all that kind of stuff. We're just simply repeating what the Bible says. Our Lord, our God is indeed one. But God was relational from the very beginning and God created man in order to have a relationship with man so that man would freely choose to be with him. We are relational as well. We, I mean, a man is not an island unto himself as the uh, writer says. When God created Adam, and Eve. God knew that Adam was alone in the garden. And God looked at what Adam was doing and said, it's not good for man to be alone. I will create for him a helpmate. And the helpmate is Eve. Eve wasn't created to be dominated by uh, Adam so she just shut up and do what he says. No, but Eve was created to complement Adam. And it was, it was later on down the road in the Garden of Eden where they both, not just Eve, but they both uh, sinned and ate of the fruit where God told them not to eat from. And then that allowed for sin to come in to their household. And sin became a legacy for all of us ever since then because Adam and Eve were the first man and woman. And from both of them came all of mankind. And how did that happen? Well, first of all, Adam and Eve lived for over 900 years. And they kept having kids the whole 900 years. Now think about 900 years of having kids. Uh, and, uh, and you can average a kid a year. Uh, and those kids have kids, and then those kids have kids, and da 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 and it keeps going on. What happened is that God created Eve so that Adam would have someone to be with for the rest of his life. Marriage is for the rest of your life. Marriage is, so, is, is, is created 
so that you would have someone to share your victories with, so that you would have someone to share your defeats with, so that you would have someone and have a base in which to emotionally get yourself together. I remember watching a movie when I was growing up between with Billy Dee Williams and Diana Ross. And Billy Dee Williams said a very profound statement to her in this movie called Mahogany. She had aspired and became a great uh, model overseas. And this is how this old movie, I guess I'm dating myself, how this wonderful old movie goes. But then Billy Dee Williams says something profound. He says, success is nothing if you have no one to share it with. It's empty. You know, after the bubbly is through flowing, after you're through coming off the high of the event, then you have no one to share it with. And so marriage helps to create a, sustain, a sustaining of uh, mental stability and all those things. Now, for those of you who are single, say, well, I don't need marriage. No, you don't. And everybody's not marriage material. I totally agree with that. Everybody that's married should not be married. Everybody doesn't make a good marriage candidate. You know, um, if you have a tremendous amount of insecurity, trust issues, and you're not about to change who you are, and you're not a sharing person, you're selfish, you're narcissistic, which means everything's got to be about me, 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 me. If you're not, you've got to complete me. You've got to entertain me. You've got to make sure I feel good about me. That's why I'm marrying you. Oh, no, you, you are way too much work in order to sustain a marriage. But God is the architect of marriage, and he knew that it was essential for us to realize that before we get married, there's some questions we need to answer. Not only that, but there's some things we need to realize. God created marriage. God created male and female for marriage. Now, the roles between male and female in the marriage are very clear. In the Garden of Eden, when Adam sinned along with Eve, God handed out the punishment for all of them, including the snake. The snake would crawl upon the ground on its belly and eat dirt for the rest of its life. Eve was then given a decree from God and saying, because you introduced this, your desire shall be of your husband and he shall rule over you. In other words, there's an accountability in the household. And this is where it gets sticky because I know it's not popular to say, but somebody in the household has to be responsible. Somebody has to be responsible and somebody has to be accountable for what goes on in that household. Ultimately, the final decision falls upon, you know, the CEO, so to speak. If the man is, the man was responsible for sin ultimately coming into his household, even though it came through Eve. Sisters, if you are someone who says, you can't tell me no, no matter what, or you can't tell me nothing, no matter what, then you're missing the point. The man is the head of the wife, just as Christ is the head of the church and gave himself up for it. That's a dual sacrifice. That means the man has to give up his life for his family, do whatever it takes legally to provide for his family, protect his family and his wife, nurture his wife in the word and in life. The woman is the main influencer in her household. No one has more influence on that house than the woman. When you come into a house, that house is decorated typically by the woman and she sets the tone in her household. The woman has the influence like the, like the, the, the uh, my, my, my uh, big, big fat Greek wedding, very profound statement. The man is the head, but the woman is the neck and she can turn the head whichever way. And you have that kind of, uh, of influence. Let me show you, let's share something with you ladies. You don't have to fight for the leadership of your household. You are the number one influencer of the house. If you understand how God created you ladies, you would not fight for, your lead for leadership. You would understand you have plenty of power welding within you already. Just like God created women to love men and you almost can't figure out why I, I love these crazy creatures called men. Uh, ironically, it's programmed in us 